identity. It's all that we are. I am a woman. I am a veteran. I am a queer person. I am a member of a military family, and the list goes on and on. Before I was the person standing before you today, I was broken. I also forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> the person that you see today is an able-bodied, appearing, moderately put-together version of myself. It hasn't always looked this way. Identity has always been important to me. My identity as a member of a military family led me to join the Navy in 2008. It pushed me to be the best sailor around, to train harder, to excel in everything that I did. My identity as a queer person was one that I put back in the closet to serve. It was a piece of me that I sacrificed to be a part of the military. It led me to a life of isolation during service and for several years more after service. My identity as an athlete was one that was stripped from me. After several failed surgeries on my sternum, I found my body irreparably damaged. This evolution shook me to my core. When I could no longer be me or live the life that I had imagined, I lost my identity, my sense of purpose, and all of what I knew about myself. In 2009, after two failed surgeries on my chest, I was living in the Wounded Warrior Barracks at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego. One night, after after a particularly rough incident between myself and the corpsman in charge of the transition unit, I found myself sitting below my fifth floor window with it open. Debating whether or not I was going to jump from it. In that moment, I reflected on my life. I thought about who I was, what a mess I had become, and I wondered if I would ever be able to look in the mirror and like the person that I was one day going to become, or if this was all I had in store for my future. I sat there and I cried, and I cried, and I cried. I cried for the loss of the life that I had always known. I cried for the fear of what was to come. I cried for the intense and overwhelming pain that had taken over my body and consumed my mind, and I wondered why I should keep living. I spent the last few months reflecting on why I didn't jump that night, and if I'm being honest, it's because I wasn't sure what I was more afraid of: living or dying. In that moment, I made a decision. I decided to stand up, to leave my isolation. And to go sit in the emergency room waiting room. You see, as a queer person serving under "Don't Ask, Don't Tell," I had learned that if I kept my secrets to myself, if I kept myself isolated from my peers and from those closest to me, I was safer. The fewer people that knew my secrets, the safer I, more protected I was. But I knew I wouldn't survive the night if I kept doing that, and so I stood up. And I went to that waiting room, and I sat there until what felt like the early hours of the morning. I sat there until I trusted myself to go back to my room and get help. Fast forward to 2012. I had survived that night, but only barely. After another major surgery left me with a nine and a half inch metal rod in my chest that held my insides together, I was being medically retired from the military two years before I was set to my contract was due to end. And I found myself with my car packed, driving from San Diego to Seattle. When I returned home, I truly had no idea of who I was. While I felt an unending sense of liberation, I simultaneously felt a sense of loneliness that I didn't know how to face. What no one had warned me about when I left those gates for the last time was that I would feel like the military's castaway as soon as I got home. In place of the comfort and familiarity of my military family was only insecurity and doubt as to whether or not I was worthy to wear the cloth. I didn't know what to do. I had no idea what I was supposed to do or what my sense of purpose was. I lost it, but I got it back. And then I looked back, and I never thought that I was a part of a bigger picture. What is the bigger picture? A lot of times, the biggest fault is that we isolate ourselves. We get caught up in that isolation. We feel that we're alone, and we're the only one experiencing that deep, dark pain. We lack that community. We lack that sense of purpose. 
However, as unique as the journey is to the individual, the shared experiences are shared worldwide. I too have a similar story. I have received a medical discharge in 2005, and as excited as I was, I said, yes, I'm free. I walked out those gates with my DD-214 in hand, waving it around like a crazy person. I might have blown it up a little bit and put it in on a nice little plaque. I can't confirm that. But something happened. I realized I did not have a purpose. What does that mean? Purpose is, is a huge purpose. For five years, I served in the army, right? I didn't have to have a purpose because, God damn it, they give it to me. <laughs> they told me when to wake up. They told me when to go to bed, do some push-ups, eat your food. I don't have that anymore. The first five years of my adult life, I was told what to do. Now what? So there I went, wandering, wandering the earth, aimlessly, with no purpose, taking dead-end jobs, dead-end relationships. But fast forward to 2015. I got involved with a nonprofit called The Mission Continues. And with that, I found what my purpose was. And it was clear as day. And that purpose got stronger and stronger over the years. That purpose was service. It never changed my entire life. At the age of 17, I raised that right hand to serve my country because I wanted to be part of something greater than myself. And it took me a long time, 10 years after I got in the military, to realize that service has just been something that I have always wanted to do. It is my passion to be around like-minded people. And everybody likes to be around like-minded people because it's comfortable, right? We love to be inspired and empowered by people around us who have the same mission, vision, and values as I do. So there I was, serving with the Mission Continues, proudly. And on my very first project, someone came up to me whom I did not know. He put his hand on my shoulder and he said, I need you to lead. Whoa. <laughs> I, I just came here to, to do some work, guy. Like, let's, let's back it down a bit. He's like, don't worry, I got you. He gave me the tools. He gave me the instructions. He gave me the guidance. He empowered me. So where do we go next, right? I'm beyond survival at this point. I'm thriving. I'm wanting more. I know my worth, and I know that I want more. So what can I do? A year and a half later, I took over that same position he did as the first service platoon leader in Tacoma. And so with that, we serve in multiple communities. One of those communities is in the east side of Tacoma, where every month we dedicate our time to a park in the east side of Tacoma. That is my community. I work with minority veterans as the Veterans of Color Program Coordinator, focusing on equity and inclusion and building a more inclusive environment for minority veterans. That is my community. I work with veterans of everyone from everywhere because I love veterans. That is my passion. So I'm gonna do something really quickly and I challenge you to take part in it. This right here, we call this a knife hand, right? <laughs> I want you to take that hand, make it ever so strong, point it in a general, general direction of people, and I want you to say these three words. Are you ready? I want you to say, you, you are dope. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll wait. Go ahead. Let me explain. Number one, to be dope. Number one, to be dope, you must be determined. With determination, it implies, and you know that you have the knowledge that it is not going to be easy. People will get in your way, but people will also back you. That is the asset of a community. Number two, it requires you to be open-handed. Now, this is a two-fold meaning. Number one, understand that an open hand has more purpose and more uses than a closed fist. The open hand controls the fist. At any time, you could put it right back to where it needs to be. Number two, it also means to be generous. 
Be generous with your time. Be generous with the people around you. Share your truth. Know your worth. And if they don't know their worth, give them those words. It's lovely. I promise. To my wife, I love you. I needed to be led. And you pulled me while I kicked and screamed to find my purpose. Thank you. You are dope. You are dope. <laughs> She's a lot cooler than I am. Right? Three. Be purpose-driven. Understand that your purpose is important. And it goes back to knowing your self-worth. You deserve the greatest of things that you desire. So go and seek them and keep that purpose in your mind when you form your vision. And it will be ever so clear. Lastly, you're empowering. You understand the importance of the position that you are in and where you now stand. I never thought in a million years that I would be standing up here on this stage talking to all you people looking good, <laughs> right? I look good, right? I wouldn't have thought that. I never would have thought that. I lacked that self-confidence. But people, my wife, my friends, my brothers and sisters, they empower me. And that goes back to generosity. Give it back. I challenge you to give it back, whether it's with words or a hug. You want a hug today? I'll form a line. I love hugs. Okay? I do. I'm a hugger. I am not a handshaker. I am a hugger. I am a lover. I am a fighter. I will fight for you day in and day out because it is what you need. It is what you deserve. You are determined. You are open-handed. You are purpose-driven. You are empowering. Say it with me. You are dope. Thank you. <laughs>